Hi all, and welcome back to another podcast from um, Forum Historia. Today it's just me, but, you know, this is just sort of a, a smaller, uh, shorter outside topic um, that I kind of wanted to talk about. Um, so what is that topic? Well, today I'd like to talk about uh, love in the medieval world and sort of what that looked like and what the implications of love were for um, medieval society and 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 that sort of thing. Um, so the argument that I'm going to be making to you all um, today is that love was bad. It's not something that uh, someone in medieval Europe would ever aspire to achieve. Um, and instead, it's actually, there's a lot of warning, um, the tales of warning about it to, to stop people from um, falling in love. And essentially, it was considered that love was uh, too frivolous, really, to um, to determine marriage and, and other very important things um, of that nature. So, the first thing I want to draw our attention to to sort of illustrate this point is, um, it's, it's a little bit later, it's not necessarily from medieval Europe, it's from um, more specifically Renaissance Europe, it's that of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Um, and to us, we can see Romeo and Juliet as being this really romantic love story about um, two people who uh, were destined to be together, who were drawn together by love, um, but who were you know, prevented by um, their families and, and social standings from uh, achieving that love. Um, but in the context in which it's written, this understanding is not so much the case. Um, for example, consider the ending of Romeo and Juliet, the, the two characters, the two central figures, uh, because they can't be together, decide the best course of action is, is to commit suicide. And, you know, even to us today, um, suicide is probably not the best um, of actions to take. Uh, I know of very few people um, other than <laughs> university students like myself who would actually uh, consider or want to, to die, um, essentially. And, you know, going further than that, think about it in sort of a religious context. Um, you know, suicide in particular is a a terrible sin, um, one that will result in you going, you know, straight to hell. Pretty much, it's it's not it's it's one of the worst sins that you can commit. So this sort of outcome, this ending, is not so much the romantic tale that we would think of it as, um, but instead it would be more of a uh, a cautionary tale against love, because this is what love wrought. It love it it um, brings you to to suicide brings you to hell, essentially. It's, it's not somewhere that you would um, ever want to be in this society. So the next sort of story, or the next sort of example I want to use to sort of understand uh, love in this world and, and how it's actually portrayed, it's a, it's a French song, um, which I, I can't pronounce the name of, but I'll try. It's Jolie uh, Lotrière Errant. I don't know. I'm not French. I'm sorry if I absolutely destroyed that. Um, but essentially, it's a it's a it's a medieval um, song from um, the 13th century, written by a guy called Thibois de Champagne, Champagne, um, and it it it's it's quite a nice little song actually. It's it's been recreated, and I'll I'll play a little bit for you. Essentially, it's, it tells the story of um, a young knight 
who's you know riding down um, the road and he sees this beautiful young woman um, in a field and he goes up to her and he um, proclaims his love for her and and that you know he wants to marry her and all such things um, because she's just so gorgeous and all that kind of stuff and he's just immediately fallen in a, um, like in love with her um, and so what he does is he you know um, takes her up onto the horse um, and they they begin riding off until um, all of a sudden he can hear two um, people yelling and, and calling out uh, from behind, you know, and he realizes that you know two shepherds um, sort of emerge and, and come running for him, um, and so he lets her down and he flees from there pretty much immediately, right? And the 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 idea of the story is that um, he realizes that these two shepherds are the relatives of this young woman and that he was about to essentially marry um, a shepherdess, right? <laughs> right? Like a knight marrying a peasant? Nah, it's not happening, right? It's, 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 it's unthinkable. It's disgusting, you know, <laughs> right? Would never actually happen. And so the moral of the story is, you know, again, love um, brings you to places that you don't want to be in this case. Uh, you don't want to be marrying, you know, well below your social status, right? And so therefore don't um, let love get in the way of more important things such as marriage. Um, those things should be uh, organized um, elsewhere, which we'll talk about um, in a minute. So so why is why is marriage uh, so important <clears throat> um, and, and why love therefore is is so excluded in this society? Um, well, marriage there's two there's two reasons for it right We have the um, religious aspect of it, which we've already seen from Romeo and Juliet, and the uh, the the sort of social aspect that we saw from the the song. Um, so we we'll begin with the religious aspect, right? So you know, again, um, love, right, can bring you to to hell, right? And and in religion, right, in, in you know, Christian religion specifically Catholic religion, um, you know, a lot of emphasis is placed on, on the sanctity of, of marriage. Okay. It's, it's, it's something that should be, um, done and withheld to the highest standards. And, you know, as a result of that love and, you know, love making that of, you know, fornication or whatever, is is a pretty deadly sin um, that should be avoided at all costs, right? And it's this sort of religious aspect for why love is um, a sort of you know a terrible thing in this society, right? Because love will bring you to um, inevitably like love making and things like that, um, which is obviously something to avoid at all costs. And we can we can also sort of see this from. Uh, and uh, you know a bunch of other sources, but in particular, um, I'll note Dante's Inferno, which is a divine comedy written by the uh, the poet Dante. Um, and and the the story is about this this guy that's um, kind of in hell, um, and to get out of hell, he has to climb this this mountain towards um, towards heaven, towards light. You know, it's it's all uh, it's all an allegory essentially. Um, but, you know, he comes across uh, a she-wolf, right, a beast, which, um, you know, he uh, he essentially has to avoid, he has to overcome um, this beast, and of course the beast itself being a she-wolf is, is sort of an allegory for, um, for a woman, you know, the temptations that women bring, you know, that of, um, you know, fornication and, and, and love, you know, because love brings you to um, sex and stuff like that. Um, and, and so, you know, to essentially get to heaven, right, the story is saying that you need to avoid that pretty much at all costs, right, um, and remain pure to yourself and, and to God. Um, but, you know, you might ask, well, why not fall in love, get married, and then, you know, in the eyes of God, everything's fine, and, you know, that's true, um, but that's where we sort of get to the the sort of statesman um, social aspect of of why love is not something that you want to do, and it's that it it it's too frivolous to decide who you should be marrying, right? So in the case of of the French song that we um, listened to, uh, 
you know, love almost brought a knight of relatively high social standing to marry um, a peasant, essentially, um, a peasant sheep farmer, which is, you know, obviously not really what you want to be doing. Um, and moreover than that, you've got to consider that uh, medieval Europe is a dowry society, um, so the bride's family um, gives dowry to the bride, um, usually in the form of money, goods, or land. Um, and essentially what they're doing is they're buying a husband for the wife, right? They're, you know, the, the husband might have social standing that the family wants to get a part of, or perhaps a business, something like that, who knows? Um, there's, you know, a lot of different reasons why you'd want your daughter to marry into a particular family. Um, but essentially you're paying them for that privilege, right? And so marriage in a nutshell is really a, a contract, right? Where funds, where something is being traded, right? And so as sort of, you know, a patriarch or even a matriarch of a family who is deciding who your children are going to marry, you don't want them to be choosing based out of love. You want them to be, you, you want to be choosing exactly who this deal goes to um, for obviously political reasons or for, you know, your own family's gain, right? So again, love is just too frivolous to really determine who should be marrying who. The last thing I kind of want to talk about is, you know, we've, we've talked about how love is really seen in this society, um, but I want to look at what love, what the reality of love is. Um, and this, this takes us to uh, the letters of Abelard and Heloise. Um, both are, are Frenchmen um, from the 13th century. And, you know, Abelard is a, a dialectic and theologian, right? Somebody who teaches, uh, you know, letter writing and things like that, as well as theology. Um, and Heloise is his particularly gifted um, student. And, you know, as, as the letters show, um, the two of them, they, you know, they fall in love or whatever, um, and they do lots of um, sinful fornication, you know, as you do. And the uncle of Heloise, the, the guy that um, is her, you know, guardian, you could say, um, finds out eventually, and he's, he's obviously quite pissed by this, right? Because, um, you know, Abelard has betrayed his trust and, you know, more importantly, um, he's stolen the, the sort of purity um, of his um, niece and, you know, by extension, she's she's now a sinner, right? Um, and so to make up for this, they they get married, but it's, it's not quite enough. And so um, what happens is Abelard gets um, his nuts cut off, his, his testicles are, are cut off by um, the followers of the uncle as payment for um, for the deeds that he's done um, but the story doesn't end there because you know you might you might say well you might say that um, you know this is this is in repents for um, the f you know fornication which is quite sinful um, and not so much for love well the letters continue and you know you can see that that Heloise truly does, you know, is quite deeply in love with Abelard, and even when after uh, his testicles were cut off and they, they are no longer um, having sex anymore, she still, she still threatens to, to sort of kill herself if Abelard was to die, right, if he was to be killed by his enemies or whatever, because he, he talks about it quite a lot. And and so you know we can see that again. This is this is what love actually in this society brings you to, right? It brings you to the brink of essentially destruction. It brings you to the the gates of hell, um, in reality. And and that's you know obviously quite bad. You know this is a real example of two people um, who are pretty much at the the end or the edge of of their their social life. You know they are in turmoil constantly you know for example Heloise um, she essentially she becomes a nun to to make up for all the sins that she's done and 
she has a battle with herself in her own mind because on one hand she's outwardly um, expressing herself as you know quite a chaste and virtuous person um, who people consider to be quite you know a successful sort of nun um, and and somebody to follow in the light of God um, but on the inside she still thinks about uh, her life with Abelard and, and all the things that she did and she still enjoys those memories she still loves Abelard um, and so she feels herself a hypocrite and you know she has this sort of battle this torment in her own mind um, where she's trying to reconcile with all of this and it's it's really torturous for her because you know she considers that although people think that she's quite pious and will end up in heaven she knows in her mind that you know because of what she's thinking and stuff um you know god knows exactly what she's thinking and, and therefore by extension um she knows that she's probably going to end up in hell and it's it's quite scary for her she's actually quite she's she's very intelligent um and it's it's quite an interesting read. I would suggest it to anybody um, who's sort of interested on the topic because she is very intelligent. She's quite um, metacognitive of her own um, thoughts and understandings. Um, so yeah, again, I, I would quite recommend the letters of Abelard and Heloise to uh, to somebody um, wanting to know a little bit more on the topic. But yeah, so that's that's pretty much you know that's pretty much it. Um, that that's kind of why love is seen as such a negative thing in this society, right? It, uh, you know, for religious purposes, it um, is quite uh, damaging. It it will bring you to hell um, in in most situations, and from a social perspective, it's quite damaging also because uh, it's it will lead to bad marriage decisions. Um, you know, as opposed to ones that are carefully thought out and quite diplomatic and political, um, that you you know your patriarch or matriarch, whoever's running your family, will have decided for you. Um, it's not really your place uh, as sort of someone who's younger in the family to really make the decision of who you should be marrying. That's a family decision um, because it affects the family as well as you, um, and so therefore it should be made by the head of the family rather than yourself or by any notion of love. Anyway, so that sort of brings us to the end of this little podcast. Uh, I hope you kind of enjoyed it. Um, it's a little quick one today, um, although I've been talking um, for a fair while now. Um, but yeah, thanks again. Uh, I hope to see you in the next one.